Would you pray with me? Lord, we are once again in your house and we are grateful. We are grateful that as your people, we are invited to come into your presence. We don't have to go to a tabernacle. We don't have to go to a priest because we have one priest who is now in heaven on our behalf. Truly glorious Christ, we praise you for what you have done and what you are doing for us. And now as we approach this passage, as we will speak of Christ, we pray that you will be put on display. We pray that the Spirit would open the eyes of all of us here to behold glorious Christ. Those who are unconverted, we pray, Lord, that you would do supernatural work of regeneration. And those who are converted, Lord, may we receive the illumination of the Spirit to behold glorious Christ. Because that is what this passage is all about. I pray that you give me grace to take us and walk us through this passage for our understanding, our edification, and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, 123 million people tuned in to watch the Super Bowl. This was the most watched television program, second only to moon landing in 1969. So many people watch the Super Bowl, and they do it for different reasons. Some love the game. Some watch it just because they want to see the commercials. This year, a 30-second spot would cost you a meager $7 million. With so many people watching, it would be a great opportunity to present Christ. Would it not be? Well, that's what he gets his campaign attempted to do. They created an ad, and they said the message of the ad was this, Jesus did not teach hate, he washed feet. Now in that ad, if you have seen it, they have different individuals washing feet of others, and the people that they chose for this ad, whose feet they washed, were all considered by our culture here as marginalized and oppressed. You had the black, the gay, the Native American. You had the queer, the transgender. And you watch that ad because the message of it is to present Christ. And in one scene in that ad, it tells you everything you need to know about that campaign. There's a picture of an abortion clinic. And in front of it, a woman is washing the feet of a young lady. Now, in the background, there are this group of people, and they're holding signs that say, you know, save human lives. And the message was pretty clear that Jesus would not stand there with them, but what he would be doing, he would be washing the feet of this woman here. And the question that I ask, is this Jesus of the Bible? Is this the Jesus that we are studying about in this passage? And I would argue that this ad proclaimed false Christ on the most televised program of our generation. You see, our culture today does not need Jesus who will affirm you in your sin and even wash your feet while you're at it. That is not where our culture needs today. You're gay? Well, Jesus gets you. You're a man trapped in a woman's body? Well, Jesus gets you. That was the message of the ad. And the reality is that that is not the Jesus of the Bible. This is an idolatrous ad because it separates grace from truth. And as you will see, Jesus of the Bible is full of grace, but he is also full of truth. This Jesus that was presented is no different than your pagan friend or a family member who affirms you in your sin. But this is not the Jesus of the Bible. Over the last month or so, we have been working through this prologue that John wrote in his gospel, first 18 verses. Now John reached back into the eternity past to tell us that before there was the beginning, this Jesus already was. This Jesus that John presents is the eternal, self-existent God who spoke the universe into existence. He's life because he's the source of all life, spiritual life and physical life. 
And this life manifested itself in the light as he came into this world to enlighten man. How did the world respond? Last week we saw three responses. The world did not recognize him. By and large, it continued to operate as if nothing happened. While the creator of this world entered creation, the world continued to go about as it did before. The nation rejected him. His own people, John said, the nation of Israel, those whom he purchased, those whom he redeemed, those whom he chose of all the nations, those people not only did not recognize him, yes, they recognized him, but he was not the kind of Messiah they expected. So they rejected him. They rejected him, handed him over to Romans, and the Romans crucified him. So the world did not recognize him. His nation rejected him. And then there was another small group, those who were born again. And according to John, those who were born again believed in him. Now, they believed in him. They received him, not because they were intellectually, morally, or physically superior to everyone else. That is not why. The reason why they received him, because God, sovereignly in his grace, caused them to be born again. The text says, because they were born of God. This outward illumination was accompanied by inner regeneration, and only that resulted in true, genuine transformation. That's why we argue that regeneration is not the result of your lineage. It is not the result of your effort or anyone else's effort. Regeneration is the work of God, which he sovereignly performs in the lives of man. Now, in verses 14 through 18, which are our verses for today, John closes this prologue by further elaborating on Christ's first coming into the world. The reason we call this section the incarnate God, because John explains to us how this eternal, self-existent God entered time and space. You will see in verse 14 that he comes back to this title that he used at the beginning, and the Word became flesh. He is the Word of God. And he is the word from God. And the reason why John uses that, because in our context here, he's going to say that Jesus is the one who reveals God to us. That's why today I want to defend this proposition. Jesus Christ became man to dwell among men and to make invisible God visible. That is the point of this text. Jesus Christ became a man to dwell among men, and to make invisible God visible. Now, to help us grasp this profound section here, I want to give you three words to hang your thoughts on. The first word is incarnation. Incarnation. And here we're going to talk about Jesus became man, because that's what John 14, the first part of John 14 says, 114. The second word is assimilation. Jesus didn't just come on Friday morning, died Friday afternoon, and went back to heaven, rose on Sunday, and ascended. No. Jesus came and he dwelt with us. Jesus dwelt among men. And the third word is revelation. Jesus revealed God to man. Join me as I read John 1, beginning in verse 14. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him, and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace." For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Let's begin with incarnation. Jesus became a man. Look again at verse 14. And the word became flesh. 
Now, this word became is familiar to you by now because it is used at least 10 different times in these first 18 verses. As we have said already that the word already was, that's first three verses or first four verses, he already was before the creation. And now John fast forwards to the day when the angel Gabriel showed up in the small little village speaking to Mary. And said to her, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Nine months later, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This was the day of which Paul spoke when he said in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. There wasn't anything magical about the birth of Christ. Besides the fact that he did not have a human father, we can say that Jesus had a normal birth as any of us would. Mary carried him, just like our mothers carried us. She bare as she gave birth to him, just like our mothers gave birth to us, except conditions were probably a lot worse back in the day. But there's one distinction that John points to in this verse. You see, every single baby that is born in this world has a beginning. At the moment of conception, new life is born. You didn't exist prior to your conception somewhere there, and then you come into the world like some teach. No, every single person has a beginning at the moment of conception. But what is the difference between you and Christ is that Christ did not have his beginning when he was conceived in Mary's womb. John already told us that the word was in the beginning. In the very beginning, back in Genesis chapter 1, Jesus already existed. But now here he fast forwards and he says, and the word became flesh. When Jesus was conceived in the womb of Mary, he's adding something to himself that is not the beginning of Jesus. Looking from the perspective of eternity, Jesus says this of himself in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. He said, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. The Father prepared the body for the Son, which was conceived in Mary's womb. When we come to chapter 1, verse 14, John is saying on that night when Jesus was born, the eternal entered time. The creator entered creation. The one who is infinite became finite. The one who was invisible now becomes visible. God becomes a man. Now when John says here, the word became flesh. Now, if you read through the Bible, you know that the word flesh is used in a number of different senses in the Bible. For example, the word flesh can have a negative connotation and can speak of your carnal nature. Paul uses it this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 13. He says, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. Now, that is not the sense in which John uses this word here. The way this word is used here is simply to refer to your physical body to your physical nature. Listen to Ephesians 5.29. It says, No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. You love your body, and that's why you take care of yourself. Philippians chapter 1, verse 22. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. Paul is saying, if I am to stay in this body, I am going to continue to minister to you. So when John says here, the word became flesh, he's saying that Jesus has added human nature to himself. Jesus has added human body to himself because God does not have a body. God is not a man. But here is something that is unique. The one who is God, the one who is the creator, the one who is invisible, adds to himself human body. Jesus became a man story is told of a young little girl who cried out to her mom that she's afraid of the dark in her dark room. The mother said to her, honey, don't worry. The Lord is with you. She said, yes, mommy, but I want somebody with skin on. You see, that's what happened here. 
that somebody came with skin on. He became a man. He became like one of us. And notice, he didn't just appear as man. But what does the text say? He became man. There was a popular heresy back in the day that Jesus wasn't really a man. Or he wasn't really God. But you know, he appeared as man. He looked like man. No, John says, no, no, no. He had human body just like you and I. Jesus got sick, Jesus was weak, Jesus was tired, Jesus got hungry, and ultimately Jesus died. Because he was a man, because he added to himself human nature. The author of Hebrews puts it this way, Therefore, since children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. The same flesh and blood that you have is the same flesh and blood that Jesus added to himself. Well, let me say this, this phrase does not mean that when Jesus became a man, he somehow ceased to be God. No, both are true. John has already been saying he was the word, he was the eternal, he was the self-existent one. And while we cannot adequately understand or explain these two, these two truths are clearly taught in the Bible. Jesus was fully and truly God, and yet at the same time, Jesus was fully and truly man. Yes, his deity was veiled in his flesh while he was here on earth, but his humanity was just like yours and mine. Now, it is important to believe in this truth that Jesus is both God and man because this truth has great implications for your life. Number one, because Jesus is fully God and fully man, he can be our mediator. You see, because he is fully God and because he is fully man, he can stand in this gap between God and man, and he can reconcile man with God. Because Jesus is fully God and fully man, he could be our redeemer. You see, when Jesus went to the cross and he offered himself, therefore his sacrifice was sufficient to save all those who believe in him. Why? Because he died as a man, because God cannot die. But his life had infinite value because he was not just a man. He was God, man. And because his life had infinite value, therefore, all those who trust in his sacrifice could be saved. And that is because he was both God and man. Because Jesus was God and man, we can have his righteousness. Because you see, Jesus lived on this earth for 33 years. He dwelt among men, and he accumulated the righteousness which he now gives to those who believed in him. And because of his perfect life, you can have the righteousness which is imputed to you when you repent and trust in Christ. Now, if you step back from this phrase, the Word became flesh. And think about this. What would it mean for God to become a man? I mean, this is not just, you know, taking a pay cut or taking some lower position, entry level. No, you're talking about one who is self-existent. We're talking about one who is self-sufficient, one who is omnipotent, one who is omnipresent, the one who spoke the universe into existence, who upholds all things that exist by the word of his power, and this one becomes a baby. Now, I know some of you had babies. Some of you have been around babies. But babies are not self-sufficient. They can't eat. They can't clean themselves, they can't talk, they can't walk, they can't do anything productive. No offense to babies, right? (laughs) And yet God himself becomes a baby. And you think about this, that the one who was born of Mary as a baby is still the same one who upholds the universe in his hand. Can you wrap your mind around that? No. I mean, Jesus, who created all things, He has to, as like in our gospel we'll see many times, he has to sit down by the well because he was tired from a journey. God doesn't get tired. And yet Jesus limits himself by adding human flesh to himself by becoming one of us. And what is amazing that he did this voluntarily. You know, sometimes you have to take a lower position because your boss says, no, 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 that's what you're doing right now. But Jesus became man because he did so voluntarily. Because he willingly submitted to the will of the Father. 
Philippians 2.6 says this, who although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself. And what does it mean that he emptied himself? By taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He did not hold on to his position, but he stepped into space and time and became one of us. Now, while he did so, he did not give up his place as God. He still was God. Wayne Grudem closes his systematic theology chapter on the person of Christ with these words. Incarnation is by far the most amazing miracle of the entire Bible. For more, far more amazing than the resurrection and more amazing even than the creation of the universe. The fact that the infinite omnipotent, eternal Son of God who'd become man and join himself to a human nature forever so that infinite God became one person with finite man will remain for eternity the most profound miracle and the most profound mystery in all the universe. Amen. It is the greatest miracle that God became man. We looked at the first word. Look at the second word, assimilation. Jesus dwelt among men. John says this, and the word became flesh. And what is the next phrase? And dwelt among us. Now Jesus did not only become, but he also dwelt. He lived for 33 years. Now this word dwelt is a very interesting word. It literally means to live in a tent you can put it this way, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Eugene Peterson in his massage translation, or the message, he said, the word moved into the neighborhood. That's how he put it. Now, when he says here, the word dwelt among us and we saw his glory. Now think about the passage that we read at the beginning of the service. Remember Moses pitched a tent. And that's where God would commune with man. If you wanted to have fellowship with God, as the passage in Exodus 33 says, you would go to the tent of meeting. The glory of God resided in that tent. And if you wanted to have fellowship with God, you went to that tent. In Exodus 33, 7, Moses calls it the tent of meeting. Septuagint, which is a Greek translation, which John was reading at that time, translates that as a tent of the testimony, which you will see will be a familiar word for us as we work our way through John. You probably heard the term Shekinah glory. Even though that term does not appear in the Bible, but the word itself comes from a Hebrew word which means to dwell. And Shekinah glory is this picture that you see all throughout the Bible. The concept is everywhere. Remember when Jesus is, uh, where Jesus and Christ and Father, taking people out of Israel, out of Egypt, Remember there was a pillar of fire, and at night there was a cloud. And the tabernacle was filled with smoke because that represented the presence of God. Later on when the temple was built, the temple was filled with smoke, which represented the dwelling place of God. And this is the idea that when God comes to dwell with people, there is some kind of a physical manifestation that we saw here. When tabernacle was erected, Exodus chapter 40, verse 34 says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, if the emphasis of the first phrase in this verse 14 is that the divine became human, the emphasis of the second statement is that the divine dwelt with human. You know, God dwelt in the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. And you as an average Jacob or average Joe had no access to the presence of God. Only once a year, a priest would go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of a sacrificial animal. And he would sprinkle that blood. He would go directly into the presence of God on your behalf. You had no access to God. God. 
The only access you had is if you would go to the priest and he on your behalf would go and offer the sacrifice. You never saw God. And yet, that is the miracle of incarnation. That in the incarnation, God himself comes and he dwells with us. Second, the Old Testament, God covered his presence with a tent so that you wouldn't see him. But in this case, he says Jesus comes and he covers himself with human flesh, with human body. And yet when Jesus walked around this earth, it was God himself who was walking among men. God told Moses in Exodus 33, 20, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Paul tells us that God dwells in unapproachable light. Christ didn't just become man and appear as a man for a little while. No, he came and he dwelt with us. And notice we know from the history, we know from the scripture that Jesus lived on this earth for 33 years. He was born as any normal child would be. He grew up like any normal child would. According to Luke, he developed just like every child does. It says, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom, that's developing mentally, in stature, that's developing physically, in favor with God, that's spiritually, and with man, that's socially. Jesus walked for 33 years, perfectly obeying his Father's will and accumulating righteousness which he would impart to us. Now notice here when John says, and dwelt among us, who's he referring to? Most likely he is talking here specifically about himself and his fellow apostles. I mean, John was so amazed with this truth that he spoke about it again and again. Remember 1 John? 1 John chapter 1, what was in the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. John's like, can you believe it? We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. You know, people today are impressed with celebrities right? Athletes, even preachers. And you know, like people take, you know, selfies or, oh, look, look who I saw. And John be like, you saw who? I hung out with God. I ate lunch with him and I ate dinner with him. For three and a half years, I lived with him. I saw God. We beheld his glory. Now, this is just mind boggling that God himself could become one of us. In the upper room, Remember, Jesus had a discussion, and he says to Philip, or Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. I mean, think about this request. I mean, Jesus, if you could just show us God, that's, we're good with that. And how did Jesus respond? Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? You know, kids ask, what is God like? The answer, God is like Jesus. Everything Jesus is, that's what God is. Because that's what Jesus came to do, which is our next point. The next word I want you to see here is revelation. Jesus revealed God to man. John says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the first two verbs in this verse here, they refer to Christ because Jesus became and Jesus dwelt. The next one refers to John and his companions. Now most of you have gone camping before. And what happens if you're spending your night in the tent and you turn on your light in the tent, what happens? The light pierces through your tent. And if somebody's walking on the outside, they could see that there's light on the inside. Now, in the sense, this is what happened when Jesus came into this world. This little tent called human body covered or held God in him. And as he walked around, sometimes he would reveal himself and the light would pierce through. And he would reveal his true identity. On the human level, this was a temporary tent tent 
that he just put on for a certain period of time in order to accomplish his mission. But what's amazing about this, that Jesus will always be a man. Jesus came to dwell with man. He died, he rose again, received his new resurrected body, and in his new resurrected body, he ascended to heaven, and guess what? He's coming back in his resurrected body. And for all eternity, Jesus will be God, man, because he came to dwell with man. Now, when John says here, we saw his glory, it's the same we that John said earlier. Now, most of the people, as we said last time, they did not recognize Christ. Most of the world, they just kind of kept going as it was. People were not impressed with him, for the most part. Remember, in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, people of his hometown said, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. According to John 7, even his own brothers did not believe in him. Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53 too, he had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Again, Jesus was not a Hollywood star. What he's saying here, Jesus was just like every other man in his own town. Very few whose spiritual eyes were open actually saw Jesus for who he was. And John says we were one of those some of those people, we saw, we were eyewitnesses, we beheld, we observed, we looked upon. And what did they see? He says, we saw his glory. Now we saw already from the passages in the Old Testament that when God would appear, there would be some kind of a manifestation of the presence of God, which they call glory. And we can say that in the Bible, glory is the visible manifestation of the presence of God. John Piper puts it this way, Glory is a public display of the infinite beauty and the worth of God. How do you see God whom you cannot see? Glory. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, we read this, And one called out to another said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. That is who he is. Holy, holy, holy. Notice the second part. The whole earth is full of his, you would expect holiness. But what does the text say? Full of his glory. That is the visible display of the Lord. Now when John says here that we saw his glory, what he's saying is that Jesus Christ is the final and complete display of the glory of the infinite God. Now, John wrote this, as we said before, about 60 years after Christ ascended to heaven. For 60 years, he had opportunity to reflect back on the three and a half years that he spent with the Lord. I mean, we can say that for the most part, disciples were just as clueless as the rest of the people when they walked around with Jesus. Remember how many times Jesus had to confront him? Oh, you have little faith. And there, there were things that they just could not understand, they could not see. And it is only after the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God came, as Jesus promised to them, the Spirit will remind you of all the things that I taught you. It is only then that they were able to put the puzzle pieces together and realize, wow, we walked with God. They believed in Him, they trusted Him, that they did not have a complete understanding or more full understanding, which they received only after the day of Pentecost. I mean, there were a few occasions when Jesus displayed himself. You remember Mount of Transfiguration? Mark chapter 9, verse 2 says, Six days later, Jesus took with him three disciples, Peter and James and John, and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no laundry on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them, along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And there's Peter, James, and John. They see Jesus' true identity, who he is. It is as if Jesus peeled back the curtain. He's like, guys, let me show you something. Don't tell anybody about this until I rise from the dead, but let me show you something. And they were like dead men. Throughout the Gospel of John, John tells us that the signs and miracles that Jesus performed, they were manifestation of the glory of Jesus' 
In John chapter 2, verse 11, when Jesus turned water into wine, it says in verse 11, this beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. He manifested his glory by his words and by his actions. Now, what kind of glory did John see? He says it was the glory as of one, the only begotten from the Father. Now this phrase, only begotten, has spawned many heresies regarding the person of Christ. If we do a quick survey, this word monogenes, the only begotten, that is used nine times in the entire New Testament. Luke uses it three times. In Luke chapter 7, verse 12, he's talking about the widow's son, who Jesus raised from the dead. It is used in Luke chapter 8, verse 42, to refer to Jairus' daughter, whom Jesus healed. In Luke chapter 9, verse 38... He refers, he uses this word to refer to the demon-possessed boy, you remember whom the father brought to Jesus. Now John uses this word five times, and every single time he uses it in reference to Christ. Four times he uses it in this gospel, as we'll see, and once he uses it in 1 John. The last use of this word is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 17, where the author writes this, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, And he who had received the promise was offering up his only begotten son. What does it mean, only begotten? If we take all these uses that I just mentioned here, we can summarize them this way. This word only begotten or monogenes does not refer to person's origin, but rather to his unique position. Now you can see this just from one verse. When Isaac is referred to as only begotten, Isaac was not the only son that Abraham had, was it? No. But he was the son of the promise. He was the unique son. So whenever you have this phrase, only begotten, and you'll see again and again in the Gospel of John, it is used to distinguish Christ from the rest of God's children. So in the previous passage here, we had, the, uh, we had John saying that if you trust Christ, if you believe in Him, God gives you a right to become a child of God. Yes, you are a child of God, and yes, you are a brother of Jesus or a sister of Jesus, if you're saved. But there's a distinction between you and Jesus. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. He is the unique Son of the Father. He is God by nature. You are a man, and you will never become God. God brings you in. God adopts us into His family, but we will never be God. But Jesus is the unique Son of God. When John says, we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, he's basically saying, we saw the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's what the author of Hebrews says in chapter 1, verse 3. He's the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. Christ has put God on display. And notice John further defines this glory. And he says, this was glory was full of grace and truth. Christ was full of grace and truth. Now, John does not choose these two attributes here here arbitrarily. I think I like grace. I think I like truth. Let's just put it in here. That's not what he's doing. Now, John already took us back to the Old Testament with the picture of a tabernacle. And we saw in the Old Testament the glory of God dwelling in the tabernacle. And if you were to commune with God, you would go to the tabernacle. Now, in the same context, you remember Moses says in God in chapter 33, God, show me your glory. Remember that passage? And the passage that Vitaly read at the beginning, when God came and he put himself on display, and how did he do it? He declared his name. Remember Exodus 34, beginning verse 6? Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. You want to know what God is like? Look at, what, look at his attributes. 
Look at the attributes that he lists here. God is, forgives iniquity. He forgives transgression. Yet, at the same time, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Now when Moses, or God in this case, declares himself as one who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. These two words, loving kindness, you can highlight, circle it, that's the word hesed, that is used all throughout the Bible. That refers to God's covenant-keeping love. And that word loving kindness is what John uses here, and he says this is grace. Grace is God's loving kindness. And the second attribute that he highlights here is truth. That's when he says, when Jesus came, we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father. And it was full of grace and truth. You see, the God of the Old Testament, whom you could not see, declared himself as one who demonstrates loving kindness and truth. And when Jesus shows up, becomes a man, he says, you remember that God of the Old Testament that you couldn't see, but he declared himself as full of grace and truth? I am that God. That's what John is saying here. Now, John will return to these two attributes in verse 16, but notice there's this parenthetical statement in verse 15. He keeps coming back to John the Baptist for whatever reason, and next week, Lord willing, we will spend our time looking at John the Baptist and looking at his ministry. But notice this parenthetical statement here in verse 15. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I. Here's a relevant point for today. John the Baptist recognize the supremacy of Christ. You will see that all throughout this gospel, John the Baptist always points to Christ, and he says, no, 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 I am not it. He is it. He is superior to me. John the Baptist was older than Jesus. John the Baptist began his, began, began his ministry before Jesus. And yet, all throughout his ministry, he was pointing people not to himself, but to others. He made this point earlier in verse 7. If you look at verse 7, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. He will make the same point in verse 19, which we'll look at next week. So here's what John literally says. This was he of whom I said, he who after me comes has become before me, for he was before me. What is he saying? This one that came after me existed way before me because he's eternal, because he's God. And when he came and put on human flesh, he came to reveal God to us. And we'll come back and look at more, in more details at verse 15 next time. But now look at verse 16. Now notice verse 16 begins with four. Four, which provides an explanation for what came before that. And the question is whether that's an explanation for verse 15 or for verse 14. Now in verse 15, John argues, John the Baptist says that Jesus Christ is superior to me. And you could be saying he's superior to me because it is his fullness that gives you grace. It is of his fullness that you receive grace. I am not the source of grace. He is, and therefore he is superior to me. But it's probably better to look at verse 16 as an explanation of verse 14, or at least the last phrase of verse 14. If verse 15 is a parenthetical statement simply saying that Jesus Christ is superior to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is given that testimony, but notice if you just read verse 14 and verse 16, how they flow together. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, for of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. Here are a few observations we can make from this verse. One, Jesus possesses all fullness. Notice here in verse 16, for of His Fullness. Now, his obviously here refers to Christ. And think about this claim. Jesus possesses all fullness. I mean, this was a technical term that spoke of completeness, that spoke of totality. And he's saying here this fullness includes the fullness of grace, which extends to all people. Now, if Christ possesses fullness, what does that make him? Who other than God possesses fullness? Nobody. 
completeness, totality of all the attributes, of all that is right, of all that is to be God, Christ possesses. And if he possesses all that, what does that make him? Nothing less than God. No one in the universe possesses all fullness. And yet here he says, of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Paul used this word, fullness. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, he says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in the bodily form. To say that Christ has fullness is another way of saying that Christ is divine. It's another way of saying Christ is God. Notice second, that Jesus bestows grace on whom he wishes. That's pretty clear from this verse. Of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Now, if we all receive grace from him, then obviously he's the one who grants that grace. We are recipients and he is the giver. Now, there are many implications just of this one phrase here. If Jesus is the one who grants grace, then grace doesn't come from Mary. Grace doesn't come from anyone because John says it is of his fullness that we receive grace. There is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And John says here it is of him that we receive grace. Now we saw earlier that this word grace, it means God's covenant keeping love. It is the same love that preserved Israel throughout their history. If you've been reading through the Old Testament, you probably read it through a year, right? You've seen how many times and how many chances God had to wipe them out. On so many occasions they have sinned against God and God could have just killed them all. And he was right to do it every single time. And yet, because of his love, because of his covenant-keeping love, because he made a promise to Abraham that he will carry his seed all the way through the time of Christ when Christ would be born. He promised that to them. He promised that he will sustain the nation. And because of his love for Abraham and for his people, he sustained them again and again. Now he says here, from of his fullness, we have all. Who's, who's we here? Now, these we is, are the same we that we saw in verse 14. We saw his glory. It is those who believed in him who experienced grace. It's those who received him, according to verse 12 and verse 13. And the reason why they received him, because he gave them grace to be born again. And when they were born again, they were able to respond. By extension, we can say we includes us all who believe in Christ. We have all received grace. It is his grace that he grants to whom he wishes. And when he grants that grace, he opens the eyes of believers, of those who are unbelievers, so that they would believe and trust in Christ. Notice the third observation here. Jesus bestows grace upon grace. We have all received and grace upon grace. If you look carefully in your Bibles you will see that there's most likely a footnote citation for this phrase. And the issue here is this preposition, upon. We receive grace upon grace. Now because prepositions are often hard to translate, there are multiple meanings that, or multiple ways in which this phrase could be translated. The preposition here, you probably know, it's anti, like antichrist. And it's usually that preposition will be translated as instead or instead of or in the place of, like Antichrist, the one who is in the place of Christ, who represents himself as Christ. Now here's the most popular interpretation of this phrase when John says, we have all received grace upon grace. And basically what John is saying that in Christ Jesus, you have a continuous supply of grace. As one grace is exhausted, Another grace replenishes it. And therefore, supply of grace to those who are gods are inexhaustible. Now, is that true? Yeah, that is true. Absolutely true. The only reason why we're here, the only reason why you're breathing air today is because of His grace. All that you have and all that you are is because of His grace. Is that not what Paul said? By the grace of God, I am what I am. And that statement is true of us all. And while 
This interpretation is theologically accurate, and even contextually you can say it is true that God continues to bestow grace upon grace. Everything that we have, we receive from Christ. There is yet another way to look at this, because notice verse 17. And verse 17 also begins, in our translation at least, begins with what? For. Literally, it's because. Now, because you have verse 17 that begins with for or because, we can say that verse 17 gives us a clue as to the meaning of the last phrase. Because verse 17 is the reason for verse 16. Of His fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. And you're like, okay, how do we get to the law here? What are you talking about? The law. Notice there's a contrast in verse 17. In verse 17, it says there is law which came through Moses. On the one hand, there is law. And on the other hand, he says there is grace and truth. And this grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Notice the contrast that he makes here. This is the contrast between the old covenant and the new covenant. Contextually, here's what John is saying. God graciously dealt with Israel by making a covenant with them which was represented by the law which he gave to Moses. But now in Christ, you have a revelation of a new covenant which is characterized by grace and truth. You see, because John is speaking of Christ coming into this world, when Christ came the first time, this was a transition from the old covenant to the new. This was transition from the law to grace. Now the Mosaic covenant was represented by the law. I mean, if there was one feature of the Mosaic covenant, it would be the law. And God established this covenant with the nation of Israel when he brought them out of Egypt. And the law, the purpose of the law was to govern their relationship with God. You remember, the law was not given to them when they were in Egypt. God didn't say, guys, listen, let me make this contract with you. If you sign on the dotted line, then I'm going to take you out of Egypt. Is that what happened? No. God took them out of Egypt. God delivered them out of Egypt. And then they're in the wilderness, and God is saying, okay, now for us to maintain relationship, these are the rules. This is what you have to do. And that was the law that God gave them. Now, Mosaic covenant is not a covenant of grace, as some would have you believe. But it was not devoid of grace. The very fact that God gave them the law, the very fact that God made a covenant with them, was a sign of His grace. He passed over everybody else and chose this one little dinky nation, chose this one little group of people, and decided to show grace to them. Commenting on this verse, Augustine said this, The law threatened, not helped. Commanded, not healed. Showed, not took away our feebleness. But it made ready for the physician who was to come with grace and truth. Yes, God was gracious because He showed favor to them, and He gave them strict law, which brought a curse. And then with the law, He gave them sacrifices. When He said, if you disobey this, you have a remedy. The characteristic of the old covenant was the law. And now He says this, when Christ came, the characteristic of Christ is grace and truth. Now notice here, don't miss this point, that both Mosaic law, old covenant, if you will, and grace and truth of the new covenant, they all come from who? From Christ. Isn't that what verse 16 says? Of His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. This word realized is interesting because he says grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. It's actually the same word that you have in verse 14 when it says the word became flesh. Same word. You can put it this way. Grace and truth came to be through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Listen to this quote. The old covenant and, the disp and dispensations were not without grace and truth, but grace and truth are the distinguishing characteristic of the new age. John is not contrasting truth and falsehood, but complete and incomplete revelation. Old covenant was not apart from grace, but new covenant is characterized by grace. 
Now notice here it says when Christ showed up, he was full of grace, and at the same time, he was full of truth. You see, if you neglect one and you just start emphasizing the other, you are representing the wrong Christ. If you elevate grace and you forget about the truth, you are not worshiping that Christ. And if you're all about truth without any grace, this is not the Christ of the Bible. You will read through the Gospel of John and you will see that this theme will run all throughout the Gospel. For example, in John chapter 5, Jesus heals a man who was sick for 38 years. Is that not grace? That's grace. And then we read this in verse 15 or 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. That's truth. Notice both are present. You have another example in John chapter 6. Jesus feeds 5,000. And that's grace. They're hungry for three days. He feeds you. But then, you read the rest of the chapter? The rest of the chapter, he continues to warn them that if you do not believe in this bread which came out of heaven, you will all go to hell. That's basically what he's saying. You have grace. And at the same time, it is balanced with the truth. John chapter 8. You remember he shows grace to a woman caught in adultery? That's grace. According to the law, she should be stoned. And verse 10 says this, straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. Notice, grace and truth. And both are as important. You see, Jesus of the Bible never showed grace at the expense of truth. And he always spoke truth with grace. That's why he says this new covenant and the glory that was revealed in Christ was full of grace and truth. That's why it's fitting for John to conclude this prologue with verse 18 where he says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father he has explained him. This is a summary statement of everything he already said. No one, no one, like not one person, has seen God at any time. Now we know that he's talking about God the Father here because he says here, he who was in the bosom of the Father. So this reference here, no one has seen the Father at any time. Now this little phrase here has significant ramifications. Because if you read your Bible... You ran into people who saw God, right? I mean, Genesis chapter 18, Abraham spoke with the Lord. Listen to these verses, Exodus 24, 9. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel. It's a lot of people. And they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel. And they saw God, and they ate and drank. That's pretty cool. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with train of his robe filling the temple. What did they see? John tells us no one has seen the Father. And yet, these people saw somebody who was Yahweh, who was God. I mean, I wonder who that could be. No other than Jesus Christ himself. In fact, in John chapter 12, John tells us explicitly that Isaiah saw Christ and he spoke of him. So every appearance of God in the Old Testament, which are known as theophanies, all those appearances of the angel of the Lord, everywhere where people saw God, they saw the second person of the Trinity who would come and who would appear to man. And then 2,000 years ago, he came and he put on his flesh, put on flesh so that he can dwell among men. Notice here, the only begotten God was in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Just quickly, there is a textual variant here because you might be reading a translation that says the only begotten Son, not the only begotten God. 
the earliest and most reliable manuscripts, they favor this harder reading, the only begotten God, rather than the Son, because it's much easier to see why the scribes would change God to Son than Son to God. You will see many phrases, and many times we have the phrase used, the only begotten Son. And this is the only use of begotten God, and I think it fits context perfectly, because he was trying to explain to you that Jesus is God. Jesus, all throughout he was explaining this, and now he comes to the end, and he says, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. Again, you have a picture here. It talks about proximity. The one who was with the Father. This is a reference back to verse 1. Remember that phrase? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Literally, face to face with God. The Word was to God, and now he says he was in the bosom of the Father. And the one who was in relationship with the Father prior to incarnation, he came and he did what? He explained the Father to us. Again, this word explain is an interesting word. You know this, the word exegete. When we exegete the word, we are explaining the word to you. That's why we're going here. We're looking at phrases. We're looking at words. That will pre- that's what preachers do or should do. Now, when he says here, the Son, the only begotten God, came, he did what? He explained God to us. He explained God to us. Exodus 34, 6. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. He says, you want to know what that looks like? The Son came, and He was full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus comes and puts on a visible display of God in His person, in His actions, and in His words. And that's why you can say to the crowds, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father That's why our proposition is Jesus Christ became a man to dwell among men and to make visible, invisible God visible. I began by examining this heretical commercial put on by He Gets Us. You see, we we all want Jesus who would get us. Would we not? But do we get Him? You see, the purpose of the Bible is to reveal Jesus to us. John wrote this passage so that we would know who Jesus is. In fact, Jesus himself said in John chapter 5, verse 39, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. You're reading the Bible so that you could understand who Jesus is. Now, as our text here clearly shows, that this Jesus is full of grace and he's full of truth. Yes, he extends grace to everyone. No matter who you are, no matter what style, lifestyle you live before prior to your conversion, if you come and if you repent of your sins, he will show grace to you. He extends his grace to repentant sinners. No, he doesn't celebrate unrepentant sinners. But he shows grace to those who come and humbly repent. If you don't listen to the truth, and if you don't submit to the truth, you get no grace. Jesus is full of grace and truth. But if you don't, he gets you. He gets to judge you, and he gets to sentence you to eternal lake of fire. Because you didn't submit to the truth. This is the Jesus of the Bible. Right now, we are proclaiming Christ and we're saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe the truth about Him and believe everything that He taught in His Word. And if you come, He stands there with open arms, willing to receive you. But if you don't, He's the God of truth. He's the God of judgment. He's the God who punishes sin and sinners. And it's not sinner which is thrown into hell, but it's sinners. And so if a person is not willing to repent, if a person is not willing to trust in Christ, you're putting yourself under his judgment. And he will judge you because he is both grace and he's truth. If you reject his grace, the only thing that is left for you is judgment. May it not be none of us here. May we receive grace because he's willing to give it to us. 
if we submit to the truth. Father, I ask that you would help each one of us to humbly submit and believe the truth. We who are saved, we want to live in the light. We want to obey the truth and to know Christ. And we ask that you would help us in that. And those who are blind in their sin, Lord, we ask that you would do your amazing work of regeneration, conversion, and give them grace to cry out to you and receive grace from you. We thank you for the clarity of your word, for your glory. Amen.